Okay, so I'd like to welcome everyone who's here today joining us for this session of our 12-part series, Preventing Domestic Violence Among People with Disabilities. Today we're going to be talking about medical school partnerships and domestic violence. We have two speakers. Dr. Will Marling is Executive Director of the National Organization for Victim Assistance, also known as NOVA, and he'll speak about his organization. Dr. Marling was trained by NOVA and brought that added dimension of development, his skill set and experience base in responding to people in crisis. Also with us today is Ben Beckoon, who will discuss the goals, objectives, and core components of medical legal partnerships in the context of addressing, the, of addressing domestic violence against individuals with disabilities from a holistic, team-based perspective. Ben Beckoon is a staff attorney at the Clinic for the Disabled in Philadelphia, where he focuses his practice on medical legal partnerships and legal issues affecting individuals with disabilities, including domestic violence. A few things I wanted to add is that this information does not, is not intended to serve as or replace medical advice. You should always talk to your own medical professional to find out the medical advice that's best for you. Um, if you need further support, one option is to also call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233. Um, so now, Dr. Marling, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Roxanne. It is certainly my honor and privilege to be able to speak today, and I'm very appreciative of the invitation to do so on behalf of not only the work you do, but the network you have, and of course the important needs that people face today. I'm only going to take but a few brief minutes to introduce the National Organization for Victim Assistance, because I know Ben has some meaningful, important, and very practical things to say to assist folks. But it was kind of you to include NOVA in this discussion, simply because we represent uh, the oldest national victim assistance organization in the country in the kind of kind as we do. So if you're on slide two, you'll notice that our mission is to champion dignity and compassion for victims of crime and crisis. And we have been doing that specifically since 1975. NOVA emerged out of the Crime Victims' Rights and Services movement and then institutionalized, in a sense, into an organization that has been uh, doggedly determined to champion those issues. And of course, dignity and compassion is something that everyone should have. We practically address those in a variety of ways. And that actually takes us to slide three. I would, I would just point, point out, out that, that the images there, there represent, represent four areas, four bigger areas that we address. One is training for crime victim advocates specifically. Now today, there are a number of options and a variety of training events for crime victim advocates. So we're one resource of many good resources, but we do a number of things to provide training to victim advocates. We also have a crisis responder protocol, which is really a trauma mitigation protocol, sometimes known as psychological first aid or early psychological intervention. And that can be separate or included with victim assistance. So some victim advocates have special victim advocacy training. They might also have trauma mitigation training because victims of crimes, of course, experience trauma. Or if there is a group of people who solely trained on crisis mitigation, on mitigation, and so they might do things like disaster work, those kinds of things. Being based in the Washington, D.C. area, I'm broadcasting live right now from my office, which is the great, uh, amazing thing about technology today. But because of our proximity to the nation's capital, we try to encourage and influence thinking and awareness about victims' rights as well as crisis response issues, and so we're here so that we can discuss this issues in ready, ready proximity, proximity with politicians, community leaders, and the like. And the fourth, fourth thing is represented by 800 Trinova. We have a national or North American 800 number, and that's for victims specifically to call 
to receive information about resources, gain referrals, and sometimes consultation about navigating the system. I will acknowledge that many times we are trying to connect people to resources that probably might, might be very, very close, close and they just aren't aware, aware. But, of but of course sometimes, sometimes they, they need special specific expertise that could be anywhere, anywhere and pertaining, pertaining to their, their specific, specific issue. issue. Uh, for, for instance, instance though the, the work, work that Ben does, does in Philadelphia, that, that might, might be helpful, helpful to people in understanding the needs of the legal needs of the, the people with disabilities. That, that moves us really, really to slide, slide three. three. I, like I like to, to look, at look at NOVA, NOVA the National Organization for Victim Assistance, is also, also a network, network of victim, victim assets. assets. I like, I like that little acronym. acronym. Because it, it reminds, reminds us that we're part, part of a bigger, bigger picture, we're part, part of a bigger, bigger network. network. And, and if you're, you're interested, if you're intrigued by, by network, network kind, kind of analogy, we uh, consider ourselves a node, node in this great, great vast, vast network of resources that serve victims. We can slide five. I'm going to talk about just a couple of big issues that we're involved in right now. One is that we have received a contract from the Department of Defense. And we are going to be serving as the Secretariat for every victim advocate in the United States military to certify them. And we are very honored to have received this commitment and contract to serve the armed forces in this way. Then our mission really is to set up the standards which we, are, we have set up so that the advocates represent uh, an experience, training, and commitment level expertise so that we can certify them and uh, there's quite a few in the United States military and we're honored that the military has made a determined effort to do that very thing to certify the victim advocates that is currently in development it's a very, very new operation for us it's, it's under congressional mandate so there are timetables associated but uh, we're quite, quite pleased to, to contribute to the needs, needs of victims, victims specifically in the military through serving the advocates in their, in their certification. And, and my, my fifth, fifth, I'm sorry, sorry sixth, sixth slide, slide is another, another kind, kind of big rock, rock that we're that trying, we're trying to, move, to move, and that, that is we have, have, along with, with other national organizations, proposed, proposed a Crime Victims' Rights, rights Amendment. It would be the 28th Amendment to the United, United States Constitution. And, and yes, yes, this is a big, big issue. issue. Many people don't realize that in the United States Constitution there are 23 affirmed rights for the accused. Of course, that's important in our rule of law system, but there are actually no victims' rights affirmed in the United States Constitution. At the same time, there are 33 states who have their state constitutions. So we would contend that it's time for every United States citizen and people in our nation who are victimized by crime to, to experience the basic rights that we all many times recognize as in, inalienable to us, that we are the primary stakeholders as victims, and that should be understood and respected in our law. So right now, uh, the amendment is introduced into the House of Representatives. It has been under House Joint Resolution 106. And the process is started. started. So many, many times, times when people actually know affirmed rights in the Constitution, the Constitution they assume there were. And so we believe once the word spreads and people understand this, they will be eager to communicate to their representative to be a co-sponsor for House Joint Resolution 106. So we're quite pleased to uh, be part of this, but of course want to see it come to fruition. And my last slide really is a thank you, along with some contact information. As I said, I was going to be brief, but my contact information is here, and our victim assistance line, once again, is repeated. But for anyone who would like, uh, I will also be staying online after with Ben's presentation. If somebody has, an, has any questions, uh, I certainly would be happy to entertain those. But uh, apart from that, as Roxanne is moderating this discussion, I will yield the floor to my colleague, Ben. Thanks, Dr. Marley. Can, can you hear me? Roxanne, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, thanks for the great introduction, 
Roxanne. Um, again, my name is Ben, and I am, um, like Dr. Marling, very much honored to be a part of this great online series. It's kind of part and parcel of the issues that I think about and deal with and work for on a daily basis and have for a couple years now. So it's always relevant because the issue of violence against people with disabilities is rampant. It's a, a health problem. It's a public health problem. Um, and it exists across socioeconomic lines. So um, it's always relevant and always timely, so I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, so just to give an overview of what I would like to try to communicate or accomplish during today's webinar, um, just kind of talk about my organization, the Legal Clinic for the Disabled, um, and then talk about mainly the Medical Legal Partnership model, which is a kind of an innovative, preventive approach to care um, and in the field of serving people with disabilities, which is what I do. It's a preventive approach to help people be independent and live safely. Um, and then I think we're going to open it up for question and answer. So before we go into the slides, um, my organization, Legal Clinic for the Disabled, has been around since about 1990. Um, we are located at a rehabilitation hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and we provide uh, free uh, legal services to low-income people with physical disabilities. Um, defining disability is, <laughs> depends on who, who's defining it. I'm sure other speakers in the series have addressed that, but we think of it quite broadly and really think of it as anything that limits one or more major life activities. Um, However, when it comes to domestic violence, my executive director, Linda, um, created when she was an attorney for the organization our anti-violence project. And because she has a strong interest in addressing the issue of domestic violence against people with disabilities, we have um, an exception where we take um, cases where there's mental health or intellectual disabilities only without a physical disability um, when domestic violence is involved. So we do quite a bit of work uh, in that area for people uh, with and without physical disabilities who also have uh, or only have intellectual, developmental, or uh, mental health issues. Um, I guess we can go to the slides. Before we do, um, I started a project as a legal fellow a, a, a couple years back to create a medical legal partnership specifically to address domestic violence against people with disabilities. And the genesis of the project was really kind of my own interest in interdisciplinary approaches to care. Um, I have an MSW and have done some clinical work uh, with domestic, or adolescent survivors of domestic violence, as well as some anti-violence work in the Chicago Public Schools. So I, always, I already had kind of an orientation towards the issue. Um, and then went ahead and got my law degree, thinking that it would give me some stronger tools for advocacy, and indeed it has. So taking that interdisciplinary approach and applying it to um, the area of domestic violence, I propose to integrate legal services as part of primary care. So um, basically making a lawyer part of the health care team. When it comes to domestic violence, uh, against people with disabilities, studies range in terms of what percentage of people with disabilities experience uh, domestic violence, but uh, many of the studies show that they experience it at a higher rate, and um, several national studies show that people with disabilities are experiencing domestic violence um, more severely when they do experience it and for longer periods of time. Um, and that, that may very well be due to the additional barriers facing folks with disabilities, and we can, we'll get into some of those a little bit later, and I'm sure other speakers have addressed those, um, as well as additional barriers and challenges to leaving an abusive relationship. Um, so I guess with that, we can kind of go to the first slide, or I guess it's slide number two. Um, with respect to medical legal partnerships, I'll just call them MLPs for short, MLP. 
Um, I just want to you know, communicate in, so folks have an understanding of the basics of the model and then talk about why it's around, why we do what we do, and then to use a, a case example um, of a client who is actually still my client who I think um, exemplifies both the benefits of the model and also the challenges of working with a person with um, disabilities in the context of a domestic violence situation. So go to slide 3. <coughs> what is a medical legal partnership? Well, it's um, a partnership between at least one attorney and a uh, you know, healthcare center or hospital um, where the primary purpose is to serve low-income folks or other vulnerable individuals, including individuals with disabilities in our case. Um, and the re it's basically the recognition that um, in addition to access to care, health care, and the quality of health care, um, social conditions, adverse social conditions, we'll call them social determinants of health, um, have uh, as much of or even larger impact on health than does the access to and quality of care. Um, so things like where you live, uh, what race you are, how much you make, your socioeconomic status. Um, what the numbers show is that poor people are uniformly and disproportionately sicker across a number of health indicators from asthma to diabetes to heart disease. Um, and for folks with disabilities, they're often facing um, additional physical, uh, intellectual, or um, mental challenges in addition to um, those other health indicators, which um, bears directly on their ability to deal with uh, and you know, get themselves out of uh, an abusive or a dangerous situation. Go to slide four. So the medical legal partnership model really looks at increasing access to basic needs. And although we're talking here about the basic needs that you'll see there on slide four, safe, affordable housing, uh, personal stability and safety, and it's under that category that we think of domestic violence as an issue of personal stability and safety, uh, adequate healthy food, appropriate education, and again, access to quality health care. And although today we're talking about domestic violence and people with disabilities, we at the legal clinic, and I think a lot of folks who deal with these issues, uh, we think of the res our response to the, that domestic violence in a very broad way because oftentimes the provisions in law, like a restraining order, or in Philadelphia we have a protection from abuse order which um, provides a few more protections than a, a regular restraining order, is just not enough. Um, oftentimes it may not even be the appropriate avenue to try to, pr to protect someone. Um, oftentimes people are staying in abusive relationships due to economic dependence, um, because of children, and additionally for folks with disabilities, um, they may be dependent on someone for their care, their daily care, with assistance with um, activities of daily living, um, showering, dressing, bathing, and um, uh, likewise face um, additional uh, forms of abuse, which I won't go into specifically, but things like um, withholding of medication, uh, manipulation of um, medication, uh, withholding of durable medical equipment, and things like that. So um, the basic needs of someone with a disability um, may indeed be uh, even greater than, than folks uh, without. Um, let's go to slide five. Um, kind of touched on this, but Basically, the overall health is a function of many different determinants, uh, economic, social, environmental, genetic, racial factors, um, and that these factors dis disproportionately impact low-income individuals. And um, these, um, these, these factors relate to material needs that are supposed to or intended to be addressed by laws and regulations, the safety net, basically, um, for things like food, housing, and disability benefits, but oftentimes access to government safety nets or programs is delayed. Uh, it's denied because folks, um, you know, don't understand how to access the system, or uh, there's illegal denials um, of benefits. And so, 
Uh, add to that the fact that the average low-income family has between one and three unmet legal needs, and that many of these unmet legal needs are related to their health, um, you have a situation where there is a lack of access to services that are designed um, to provide for uh, basic needs, but these basic needs also have a, a large impact on health. And go, to, go ahead to slide six. Actually, let's jump, jump to seven. So what's the result of all this? Um, uh, there are kind of many people are not receiving the legal benefits and protections that they're entitled to. Um, uh, programs have become very complex and to the point where they may be inaccessible to the average patient. Um, since about 1996, federal and state legislators and regulators have really focused more on preventing fraud than on enrolling individual uh, individuals and families in programs, and it has resulted in increasingly complex eligibility and reporting requirements. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of times folks just don't know how to enroll or they're being wrongfully denied benefits. Um, and when this happens and people don't get the benefits they need, then their medical, pair, medical care is undermined. And this kind of really gets at the reason for a medical legal partnership or the rationale in the first place. So a good example is an asthmatic patient who may be living in a moldy kind of cockroach infested house, that person, no matter how many prescriptions they're given uh, by the doctor, are not going to get better if those other vectors or triggers like mold, uh, like cockroach droppings, are uh, not abated and remain in the house. So you can take as much medicine as you want, but if you're going home to a moldy house, you're never going to get better. Um, that's where a lawyer can step in and uh, file on behalf of that client um, according to the housing code, try to get those issues taken care of, and kind of in that way becomes part of the healthcare team and addressing factors that are non-medical uh, that, are, that are bearing on health. Um, go to slide nine, please. And so the traditional clinical team um, is you know, the doctor, a nurse practitioner, a social worker, dietitian, uh, et cetera. And if we go to slide 10, um, the medical legal partnership really introduces lawyers as part of the healthcare team. Um, I view myself as a subspecialist of primary care, um, as an integrated member of the primary care team. And uh, I'm really here to work as part of the team to um, uh, you know, kind of engage in effective advocacy to address these social factors that we're talking about, and ultimately to reduce stress, improve health, um, increase independence, and to increase safety, to increase the safety of my clients. Um, when I started the project uh, a few years back, I was kind of thinking about how to address this issue of domestic violence against people with disabilities. And a lot of times, um, folks aren't getting access to needed services. And many times, uh, people don't think of themselves as being abused. So for those two reasons, there are barriers to care. And community health centers are places, they're well-worn paths of the community. They are places where people are going anyway. They have to go there for care. And um, healthcare providers are in a unique role because there's kind of an inherent trust relationship, or should be, or many times there is, or should be, um, and a, and a trust relationship between patient and provider. So um, meetings between patients and providers usually take place in a safe, secure environment. Uh, patients are used to speaking with their providers about sensitive issues, uh, smoking, sexual history, so issues that many people wouldn't discuss with other folks. They're willing to discuss with their healthcare providers. So the intention of the medical legal partnership is really to leverage this trust relationship, uh, leverage the you know high place as a community resource that uh, healthcare providers and health centers and hospitals have in the community, um, to try to use healthcare providers as frontline identifiers of potential legal problems, um, and in that sense, it really changes the approach of traditional legal services. 
traditional legal services uh, operate from a crisis or a kind of a triage perspective where you might have a legal aid organization uh, in the neighborhood, one or two in a city. Philadelphia, we happen to have actually more than 30. Um, but many of these organizations you know, take folks on a, on a first-come, first-served basis. That's if people know, uh, potential clients know that they exist in the community, if they know how to get there, and if they identify their problem as a legal one. Um, many times, none of those three things are true. But let's say someone does make it to a legal aid organization. They basically take the cases that are the greatest crises. So you might take the first 12 people in the door who have an actual eviction that they're dealing with. One thing that Medical Legal Partnership tries to do is to take more of a preventive approach um, to say, how can we um, make use of the relationship that already exists between folks and their providers, between folks and community health centers and hospitals, to try to identify early on, before they become a crisis, uh, potential legal problems. Um, go ahead to slide 13. So who are the folks who are partnering um, to form medical legal partnerships? Well, it's legal aid organizations, nonprofits like the one I work for, it's law firms, it's the private bar, private attorneys, uh, as well as law schools. And like I said earlier, they're partnering with hospitals, health clinics, and community health centers. Um, you go on to 14. So there really are, pardon me, three core components to the medical legal partnership model. And the first is direct legal services. So in the health center where I work, I work with social workers, um, behavioral health workers, nurse practitioners, and doctors to get referrals for folks for whom I address issues ranging from domestic violence to public benefits to housing. The second component of medical legal partnership is trying to improve healthcare systems. So try to improve existing resources within the health system, within a health center, to better serve more effectively, more efficiently serve clients. Um, one example of that is to create templates, letter templates, in the electronic health record where providers, having spoken with a patient and knowing that that patient may have mold or may have a rodent infestation in their house, can go to the EHR and produce a letter by filling in the basic information, client's name, address, etc., cetera, um, that refers to the appropriate section of the housing code that can then be sent to a landlord really without the need to resort to an attorney. So basically it's looking for ways to leverage existing resources to more effectively and efficiently address these non-medical issues. Um, and the third is really kind of an exciting aspect of medical legal partnership. It's really not something that our medical legal partnership, which has only been in existence for a couple of years, is yet engaging in, but it's external systems change. So raising the power of the medical voice to affect policy, to affect regulations, to affect laws. Um, one great example, medical legal partnership started in Boston um, in the early 90s, and they recently had a campaign to increase consumer protections for people who were facing utility shutoff. And by uh, having doctors and nurses submit testimony uh, to the st state legislature, um, the attorneys were able to, to raise the power of that medical voice and to get changed in law uh, consumer protections for low-income people facing utility shutoffs. Um, it goes back to the inherent trust that the community has for healthcare providers and the skills that lawyers have to frame and communicate messaging um, is really beneficial when combined with the trust and knowledge and expertise of healthcare providers around these non-medical issues that are impacting health. And before we get to a case example, I just want to go to slide 16. And as you can see, uh, <laughs> medical legal partnerships are now uh, in more than 220 hospitals and health clinics in the United States. So it's a growing movement. Um, 
the project that I started were the I think the first and only nurse led medical legal partnerships. So we're run completely by nurse practitioners. Um, but they exist in many states. At the last slide that I'll show, there's a great resource called the National Center for Medical Legal Partnership. And folks can go on there and there's a, a map of the United States and you can go on there and find if any medical legal partnerships exist in your area. Uh, and if they do, the contact information is provided for both the healthcare partner and the legal partner. Um, and I'll, I'll say this again at the end of the um, presentation, but I'm always open to uh, serve as a resource to try to connect people with other appropriate resources um, or if there are professionals or other folks on the call who would be interested in starting a medical legal partnership um, or, or even exploring it, um, we're always happy to serve as a resource for that too. So, you know, in a, in a, in a presentation about um, domestic violence and disability, we've been talking a lot um, about things that don't specifically have to do with that. Um, but again, our approach to the issue of violence is a holistic one. And what we found over the years is that it's not enough to get a restraining order, but that you have to have income supports, you have to support a family, a lot of times through divorce or a custody, um, a custody battle to kind of um, disengage from the economic and family um, barriers that are keeping people dependent on their abusers. Um, and like I said, we are always happy to act as a resource uh, for folks in directing them to other appropriate resources or uh, as a resource specifically around the issue of exploring and building a medical legal partnership. Um, Great. Thank you. So to kind of bring the model into focus and to talk about how it's applied and to really talk about our, you know, the application, on, on the ground application of our team-based approach to care. Um, I'd like to use the example um, on slide 17 of Jane Jones, obviously not the client's real name. Um, to give a sense of who Jane Jones is, uh, it's a 45-year-old woman with a history of seizures, asthma, a post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression, and paranoid schizophrenia. And she was initially referred by her health care provider for housing issues. She and her husband were facing uh, foreclosure. It came out in the interview, uh, my, my first interview with her actually, that both she and her 12-year-old son um, were being abused by, by father, by husband, um, and had there had been a long history of abuse. There had been a history of both physical and sexual abuse of the client um, and physical abuse of the son for many years. And at the point where she um, interfaced with our services, she you know, didn't come to us to talk about those issues. Um, she uh, came for housing issues, but because her, her, her medical provider was proactive in um, asking about non-medical issues, uh, that person was able to, to get to us and from that initial interview um, arose the, the story. Um, so it turns out that um, she's also a patient of one of our therapists. Um, she has seen our social worker and so many different folks on the team had interacted um, with Jane. And however, the history of abuse was something at that point I know now that was known only to myself and her therapist. Um, because of her diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, um, there was some questions about, you know, well, are these allegations of abuse real? Um, or are they part of her paranoia? Uh, are they delusional? And so our, for our, my initial um, uh, challenge was to kind of help her sort through, sort through these issues. Um, I was able to connect with her therapist and with the client's consent, um, sit down with the therapist and with the client uh, to discuss the history of the case, to discuss her allegations of abuse, um, and to kind of look at the progression that the client had had with her therapist from a mental health perspective over a period of time. And 
there had been a history of hospitalizations. And one of this client's great fears, and in fact the fear of many of the clients with intellectual, developmental, or other mental health conditions who are experiencing domestic violence or have experienced um, abuse or other kinds of trauma, one of the great fears of a lot of people that I talk to or have talked to is institutionalization. Um, many times, whether it's a caretaker or um, a family member or uh, a romantic partner, uh, they will be threatened with institutionalization. And in most states, there are um, procedures to involuntarily commit someone for care. And in, and in fact, there had been a history of hospitalizations um, of Jane for um, it, you know, instances of decompensation where her, um, her you know, mental health conditions and disability got the better of her. Um, so there had been three hospitalizations at the point where she came to us. Two of those, she admitted that she was in a mental state where a hospitalization was warranted. The third and most recent hospitalization, however, was, um, in our view, fabricated by husband. The petition was filed by husband as a form of abuse um, to kind of keep her penned in and to keep her on the run, to keep her in fear um, and not acting uh, to, you know, to get herself out and to get to get herself to get herself and sign out of the situation. Um, so, you know, we obtained the records related to the hospitalizations and with the help of the therapist, um, this is actually a hearing that's coming up next month. The therapist, uh, as an expert, is going to testify in the case um, because we think that the client's disability is going to be attempted. The husband is going to try to attempt to to use her disability against her to make it sound like she's crazy. Um, and this is the fear that many people dealing with mental health issues, intellectual disabilities, are are in fear of because, uh, in general, uh, by many people, they're not believed. And folks who who don't have disabilities many times are not believed when they disclose their stories of abuse. So for those who are dealing with those additional challenges of an intellectual disability, a developmental disability, um, the fear of institutionalization and that their story won't be believed can be uh, truly debilitating and paralyzing. So um, what we try to do in situations like this, and if you go to slide 18, is to use a trauma framework to our our care. Um, a trauma framework is basically kind of shifting our conception of symptoms and recognizing the role that trauma and violence and abuse plays in developing mental health systems. And so while at the beginning of care, Jane's therapist thought that, hey, this is a pretty serious case of, 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 of paranoia, of delusion, um, after a year of treatment and uh, Jane had stabilized a little bit, she found that those initial reactions were uh, many times probably the result of trauma and abuse by the husband. So kind of destigmatizing symptoms, um, renaming those symptoms as survival strategies, and trying to focus on empowerment and resilience and hope. And while for many people with disabilities, their disability will remain, um, when, especially when it comes to mental health issues and intellectual disabilities, the exacerbation of those, um, of those disabilities by trauma and violence can be significant. Um, so it's kind of hard to talk about in a half an hour um, the issue of domestic violence against people with disabilities, but to the extent that we can look at one piece of it, um, I, I really want to emphasize that um, it has to be, in my opinion, um, a holistic approach to care that um, a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary approach is crucial and that health care providers, and I'm including social workers who work in health care centers and hospitals in that um, group, have a critical role to play, um, as do lawyers, uh, to work together to address these kinds of issues. We need to go to where the people are and folks are already coming to their community health centers, they're coming to hospitals. And if we can intersect with them um, in kind of well-worn pathways in the community with a holistic kind of one-stop shopping approach, um, then we're more likely to connect with more folks that need help. Um, so again, uh, 
that's about all I had. It's kind of a snapshot into the work that we do. Um, uh, my contact info, again, is posted on the message board and is uh, on slide 19. So I guess I will uh, thank Roxanne again for letting me speak today and stay on if uh, folks have any questions. Thank you so much. Um, we don't have any questions posted. People in these series have been tending not to post, but I just want to repeat the contact information for both speakers. So for Dr. Will Marling, it's Will, W-I-L-L, Marling, M-A-R-L-I-N-G, at trinova.org. And the website, again, is trinova, N-O-V-A, dot org. For Ben Bakun, it's B-B-E-C-K-C-O-O-N at L-C-D, P-H-I-L-A, L-C-D, Villa, dot org. Um, and you can also check out www.medical-legalpartnership.org. Will and Ben, I want to thank you both for being here. I want to thank you for the incredible work that you do and the lives that you touch on a daily basis. And to those who joined us, um, I, want to, I want to wish you all the best, and I hope that this information helps you in some way. Um, and thank you so much for taking the time to log on and to join us. Recordings of all of our sessions will be online on our community website. That's http colon slash slash community.friendshealthconnection.org. And it will also be posted on our Facebook page for the series, which is facebook.com backslash prevent violence. Um, one other thing I just want to remind you, in the NOVA website, it's T-R-Y-N-O-V-A dot org. So it's www.trynova dot org. Um, if you have further questions, you could also email our organization and we'll route your questions. And that email is info at friendshealthconnection.org. So thank you all for taking the time today. Thank you to our incredible speakers, wonderful organizations, and we hope to see you again at our next session. All the sessions are posted on facebook.com backslash prevent violence. Thank you. Thank you again to Ben and to Will. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Roxanne. Sure. Thank you.